Good evening, doctors. Sorry for the delay and welcome to the Kiron Salud Masterclass. Today we have the pleasure to introduce you Dr. David Arzamendi. Dr. Arzamendi leads the Structural Heart Intervention Unit at Tegman Medical Center in Barcelona. Before getting involved in our project, Dr. Arzamendi got a focus training in the Montreal Heart Institute and in the Massachusetts General Hospital. He has been working on the field for the last 10 years. Dr. Arzamendi is a professor of the University of Barcelona, and he's also a member of the educational group of the European Association of Percutaneous Cardiovascular Interventions. He's author of indexed publications in journals, and he has given more than 300 Congress presentations and invited lectures over the world. Three quick instructions for you doctors. The questions to Dr. Arzamendi can be typed in the questions and answer box. Some questions will be answered by the doctor at the end of the session, and the certificate of attendance can be collected at the end of the session. Please, Dr. Razavendi, you can proceed to present the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind introduction. To me, it's a great pleasure being here. I have to say that I had the chance to work in, in different uh, places of the UAE, and it's been uh, always a great pleasure being there. I have, have the chance to find really really skilled professionals with a very good training. And probably for most of you, a lot of the things that we'll be discussing today, it's that you already know about them, but I think it's gonna be a nice review about what, what we have nowadays about transcatheter mitral valve repair. So to understand any kind of transcatheter uh, uh, technology, I think it's good uh, to, uh, to know that probably we need three factors that make the, that the, the, this kind of uh, technology progress. The first thing is that probably we need a need of, uh, of this kind of therapies. The second thing is you, you need a really clever and, and really talented people who has a, a, like really good ideas. And finally, probably we need the companies that uh, get involved uh, and do an, an important reimbursement to develop this technology because they, have the, they know that they will have the chance to recover the money that they're putting in this business. So if we analyze the need of the mitral valve repair, of the transcatheter mitral valve repair, you will realize that it really exists. If we analyze what happened with the aero heart survey, we can see that mitral regurgitation is the second most prevalent heart valve disease. It's more prevalent, obviously, in elderly people. And if we compare it to aortic stenosis, you can see that these people are a bit younger, but they also have more comorbidities. They have more myocardial infarction, more coronary vascularization, more kidney disease, and more heart failure. Sometimes we have the feeling or the thought that probably aortic stenosis behaves in a most aggressive way than a mitral regurgitation does. We all know that when you have a patient with aortic stenosis, and, and it starts to have symptoms, this, uh, the, the prognosis of these patients is gonna be really poor. But it's not really different what happens to mitral regurgitation. If you check all these scores, you can see that patients with severe mitral regurgitation, at five years, almost more than half of them, they already have or mitral valve surgery or they do have symptoms or they are dead. So, you might ask, but is all the mitral regurgitation the same? Now, as you know, there are two different types of mitral regurgitation. We have the mitral regurgitation due to a degenerative MR or primary mitral regurgitation that it's due to uh, that, that one of the components of the mitral apparatus is damaged. Uh, the corda, the mitral, uh, the, the papillary muscle or the leaflets, there is some kind of damage that produces the mitral regurgitation. And on the other hand, we have the functional MR or the secondary MR that there are patients mostly with annulus or left ventricular di di dilation in which we can see that the mitral rotation is secondary to this mechanism. There is not a direct damage of the different components of the mitral apparatus, as I said, but uh, instead there is a separation of the leaflets that makes this mitral rotation. Some of you might think, okay, I know that probably most of the mitral, primary mitral MR, they are already treated and probably the functional MR, they are, they are not uh, so often operated. But if we analyze the, the data, the truth is that even in degenerative MR, the patients that got surgery is pretty low. This, is also, this also comes on also from the Euroheart survey, and you can see that these were all patients with mitral, severe mitral regurgitation, symptomatic mitral regurgitation, that they, were, they already had an indication for mitral valve surgery. And the truth is that the patients that got operated, they did, they did much better. You can see the survival course for this group of patients is much better. But the problem of this series is that almost half of the patients that they, have, they do have an indication for mitral valve surgery, they, were, they, didn't, they, they, they weren't finally operated. 
It is true that if you go to the other type of material regurgitation, if you go to secondary, to a secondary material regurgitation, the data is even worse. And almost in different series, it's almost reproducible. Almost 90% of the patients do not have surgery for this reason. So it's clear that there is a need uh, for these patients. There, there is a large amount of patients that they are not treated. And the second factor that we said that it's needed to develop this kind of technologies is clever people. I think we, it's difficult to explain the story. And if you try to ask yourself who was the first who, who developed this kind of uh, transcatheter material repair technology, uh, it probably it's difficult to say just the name. I think we need to remember that all this material history started with uh, Kanji Inoue, who developed this balloon mitral valvuloplasty, uh, mitral balloon valvuloplasty that it was also already used in the 80s. And this, and we are still indeed, and the balloon that we are using nowadays, it hasn't changed much. And as you can see, the design of the valve, it was pretty clever because it already had kind of an angle that approaches the mitral directly. And we, could, uh, we can also manage with, uh, with the estlet to, to go to the room that we want to go. So the truth is that he already uh, opened the window to develop new, new technologies and he showed that we were able to, tr to treat different mitral valve diseases. I think on the other hand, we also need to remember Ottavio Alfieri because, and as you know, he was the first who developed the H2H technique. So the thing is, Ottavio operated in a very young patient. He was a young guy who got an ASD. He didn't, he didn't really have much orientation. He had an ASD, but he had a congenital valve disease with a double of the orifice mitral valve. And he realized that this valve was completely competent. So he thought, what about if I, be, I, I operate on my patients and I try to switch the, the, this, these valves to a double orifice valve? And he decided to use this technique on some complex mitral repairs, mainly patients with anterior and posterior prolapse. The truth is that his first serious results were pretty good. The truth is that they were, they were even better when he added the annulus to the, this te surgical technique. But uh, the main concern that they have that, that it was that they may have some sort of stenosis after the surgery, they analyze with some uh, different biomechanical bio measurements, and they realize that with this double orifice, the area that you got, it was almost the same that with a single orifice valve. So probably this was what opened the room to develop these edge-to-edge mitral repair techniques. As you know, this is the mitral cliff device, and this is the wet lab and that we were uh, involved the first time that we started the mitral valve repair uh, program in our institution back in 2011. So this is, as you can see, this is a, an animal heart. We are pumping saline fluid uh, through this mitral valve, and this mitral valve has broken uh, cordae, and we are trying to grasp the both leaflets to do this double orifice uh, mitral valve technique. So here, uh, I want to show this image because you see, at the moment that you have a perfect grasping, the turbulence disappears, and you can see that there is no more mitral regurgitation there. So, and I think between probably Inoue, who decided to start with a, with a, a percutaneous mitral valve techniques, and this idea from Otavio, uh, the h 2 h repair started probably from there. Indeed, this is the result in the animal. You can see that they, they have a really good healing, and the initial concerns about the mitral stenosis, stenosis and immediately disappeared. So which is the current status of transcatheter mitral valve repair? The truth is that this is a large, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it has become a large race, and there are many companies involved in different uh, technologies and different devices. Uh, probably the most popular technique, uh, without any doubt, is the, the h 2 h technique. There are two devices nowadays, the MitroClip and the Pascal. We'll talk uh, mostly about the two of them. That is where we have the most of our experience. But you need to know probably that there are also other interesting devices. Some of them, they treat directly the ring, the annulus, and we have the Cardioban, the Carillon. And they, uh, they also are devices that are uh, trying to, to correct the, the mitral rotation due to cordial rupture, like the neocord or the harpoon. And there are some other devices uh, that try to do kind of change the remodeling of the ventricle. I have to say that every year I need to change this slide because some of the, these devices come and go, and there are just a few of them that they are nowadays available at least at the CE market. So I will focus most of my talk in Mitral Clip and Pascal. 
There are two devices that, as you know, the, the aim of these devices is to get the edge to edge repair. And, and it's, there are a thousand and thousand patients that have been already treated with this technology. Indeed, and these two devices are the, the two devices that have the most in, in clinical evidence nowadays. As you know, with the MitroClip, we have three randomized control studies, one in mostly patients with degenerative MR, that this was the Everest 2 trial. And there are two other studies for functional MR that they were uh, published simultaneously in the New England Journal of Medicine, the COAPT and the Mitra FIR. The first study in, in that I want to talk about is the, the, the Everest trial. So in the Everest trial, and it probably we get some uh, interesting lessons of uh, how to design a, a trial. The problem with the Everest trial, as you know, is they compare my, my to, uh, sur okay, to a standard surgery on patients with mostly, as I say, with degenerative MR. The endpoint was a combined endpoint of a, a, a death and need for reintervention or significant mitral rotation. And the thing is that the mitral clip did not show to be inferior and non inferior to the surgery, as you can see. And the, the outcome was filled by the 60%, 63% of patients that got standard surgery compared to this 55 that was observed in the mitral clip group. But the thing is that if we analyze them truly directly, what's repair to repair, you have to remember that in this series, and the surgeons have the chance to switch, to change the valve instead of doing a single repair. What I mean is that when they see that the result was not good, they were, they were allowed to uh, uh, just do a crossover and change the repair for valve replacement, something that it was not allowed in the mitral clip group. So if you realize if you compare directly repair to repair, almost the results are completely uh, uh, comparable. And probably, and if we take into account that this was the first experience with the device, the, the, resu the results with the next generation might be much, much, much better. The other lesson that we got from, the, from this study is that at least we got somehow some of anatomical criteria to decide which were the patients that were more suitable for these therapies. We know that patients that they don't have like long flares or, uh, or uh, long, long quantitation gaps at this moment weren't the best patients to treat. And moreover, when we did, uh, when they, press, they published five years later the, the results in long term uh, follow up, uh, we realized that probably there was a subgroup of patients that there were patients function with functional MR that might do better than the others. So this brought to the other two studies of patients with a functional MR. The COP trial, as you well, well know, it was a large trial that included more than 600 patients. They compared a, a, a mitra clip uh, to a standard uh, a medical therapy on patients uh, with a functional MR. The thing is that they really have a strict criteria for selection and they did well a lot of things, uh, not only the selection of patients, but also they decided that the endpoint, point, uh, it was a combined endpoint of heart failure and death, and it, it was a, a combined endpoint at two years. So this made that the results were really, really, really positive and the device behaved much better than patients that had, they were just only on medical therapy. Indeed, it was one of the more surprising results was that there was a clear difference, even just in mortality, between the device and the control group. And the NNT to have a, a benefit of this device is just six, that it's almost uh, never observed, even probably in the tower is not so low. However, it's true that at the same time, the Matri affair showed uh, different results. And there were in, in their study, they also included patients with functional MR. They also randomized them to medical therapy uh, or to the device, and they didn't find any significant differences. But probably the reason is this, is that when we compare the inclusion and uh, criteria, there were um, and probably two different uh, sort of populations that were included in the both studies. As you can see, uh, the grade of uh, a functional MR uh, was defined by, based on the European guidelines in the mitral FR. The COP used the European guidelines where the arrow um, needed to define it as a significant MR is it's much higher. Uh, they also, and they were more uh, strict with the medical therapy in the COP trial. They need pr first to optimize completely the medical therapy and once it was optimized, they randomized these patients. The truth is that technically also it seems that they were better, they got better results in the American study with just of 5% of uh, device failure compared to almost 9% uh, 
of device failure in the in the French registry. And this all this together might explain uh, why the results between the two studies were so different. And probably this is the, the final conclusion of these two studies that and there is a new concept that we call that is proportionally severe MR. And uh, probably this is what the co-op trial uh, patients fulfill. They are patients with really, really large matter regurgitation, but not so dilated uh, in left ventricular volumes. So we have, as I said, three randomized studies. We have talked about the generative MR, functional MR, and there are many registries. And altogether, we are getting able to do a really important thing is that uh, we are able to analyze properly the patients and select those patients that might benefit the most from this technology. We know that there are some clinical predictors of bad outcomes. We know that, that the New York Heart Association class, high class, is associated to, to, to all, all causes of mortality. We know that ischemic cardiomyopathy, patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy also have a worse outcome. We know patients that had prior surgery, even if it's just a previous arterial surgery, they have more cause mortality. Patients with renal failure, uh, atrial fibrillation, high risk uh, surgical scores. This doesn't mean that we don't, we don't need to treat these patients. It's something that uh, we have to have like a red light word in there when a patient fulfills most, most of these clinical criteria because this means that despite we do well with the device, maybe the, the patients won't have a good prognosis. Indeed, there are also some biomarkers that we can use to select the patients. We know that the, the NT-ProVMP is associated, the high NT-ProVMP over 10,000 is associated to a high uh, cardiovascular mortality. The troponin T is also associated to a, a greater uh, heart failure admission. There are some echocardiographic criteria that they, they, they have also a, a prediction on the impact of the, on the clinical impact of the patients, patients with large LV dimensions and patients with LV dysfunction, patients uh, with a, a severe pulmonary hypertension, patients with severe tracuspid regurgitation with low TEPSI. All these patients are patients that uh, they, are, they, they, they have shown to have worse outcomes than those patients that they did have these this, this, uh, uh, settings. And finally, there are other predictors that are not directly clinical, there are no predictors related to the clinical output, but to the technical success of the procedure. We know that uh, patients that have a really uh, a significant tethering with a, an, an angle of, uh, uh, of the posterior leaflet superior to 45 degrees, uh, they have a, 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 a higher recurrence, recurrence of the maternal regurgitation after the procedure. We also know that the really wide uh, uh, and, and flails also that might be associated with, with a worse outcome. We also know that if we have a small valvular area, we can have a, a mitral stenosis in the follow-up of these patients. And the, and the same if the annulus, if the lateromedial diameter of the annulus is uh, less than 33, we also know that this might be associated to a higher rate of mitral stenosis during the follow-up of these patients. But we also need to take into account that there are new devices that have been developed to uh, push these boundaries and to try to improve these patients that technically in the past we were not able to probably to treat. One of these devices is the Pascal, who has included uh, his uh, uh, little brother, the Pascal Ace. And as you know, the Pascal has some really interesting features. For uh, the first interesting feature is that we can do the independent leaflet capture. Uh, this is really interesting, uh, mainly because it allows to optimize the grasping that we have uh, once uh, we had uh, the leaflets inside the, the, the device. We are able to optimize this grasping. In the other hand, as you know, uh, the, the, the Pascal has a, an inner spacer who occupies a lot of space, and this makes that uh, the, uh, his, the, the device is able to reduce the MR, but it doesn't generate almost any tension in the leaflets. And finally, uh, the way that the device uh, averts, it's, it makes it a really excellent uh, uh, device and, uh, from the uh, safety profile point of view. So let me show you some cases. This is uh, probably one of the cases that uh, we will uh, do the indication for Pascal directly. This is a patient with a severe mitral irritation due to ischemic uh, mitral uh, cardiomyopathy. And the thing is that, and as you can see, and despite the, the mechanism and described by the echocardiographers, it was a functional MR 
the leaflets are not of good, good quality. You, know, you can see here the posterior leaflets. There is some kind of some amount of tissue there that it doesn't look really, really uh, uh, stable. And if the patient had fever, we could even think that it was a kind of endocarditis, but it, it was not because it was present there for years. And it's just that the quality of the leaflets is not good. And in those cases, the Pascal is a really interesting device because it's, it doesn't almost uh, uh, generate any tension on the leaflets. So in this case, we are able to have a single grasping, and with that, you can see on the, on the, on the right of your screen, you can see the final result with really mild uh, uh, mitral regurgitation at the end, and really good result, and patient could uh, be discharged at 24 hours. Indeed, and with the Pascal A's, we are able to treat some of anatomy, some sort of anatomies that we weren't able to treat in the past. Uh, this was a, a, a prolapse of the, of the P1. This area is difficult to treat because mainly you need to be really close to the commissure. And sometimes this, is, this might be risky because you can get a tangle with a, with a mitral cord. So in this case, we decided to go with the Pascal A's because the reason is that if you get uh, down the, uh, trapped in the corda, you are able to avert uh, the device and it's really safe to take it out. Indeed, we need to, have, uh, to use this maneuver a couple of times, but at the end, as you can see, we were able to have a really good grasping. We, got, we were able to get all the prolapse inside the, our device and the material regurgitation was almost completely abolished. The good thing of the competition among devices is that all the companies try to improve their devices. And MyTrackLib, who has been the number one in the market, and they've been like probably and the responsible of 90% of the procedures that have been done, have done a worldwide in terms of my travel valve repair, repair. So they also try to improve their, their devices. And now we have the J4. It's a really interesting device. We have four different sizes. And we have uh, some of these devices allows us also to treat some of the patients that in the past probably we, we could treat them, but we get probably more we, we got more trouble to have a good result. Let me show you a case. It's missing here. It's okay. I will. I can show you at the end. So the thing is that. And with the J4, there is the J4 has a really special side. One is the XT wide, who allows to treat really large prolapses, even Barlow cases, that because you can grab most of the, of the tissue inside the, the device, and with that you can correct perfectly the material regurgitation. Let me tell just some few words about other sorts of devices and that they have some sort of evidence also. One of them is the Cardiovan that they started really strongly and, and back, 2000, back in 2016, we already have the first publication in Jack Intervention with really promising results at six months. They were almost comparable that, to, 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 to what we had with the first generation of MitraClip. But the truth is, in the next publications, the results weren't so promising. And nowadays, despite the, the, the company doesn't say that the program is a stop, it's a bit uh, waiting for probably that they get the next generation of Cardiovan that I think it's the, G, the G2 of Cardiovan. They said that it's going to be ready for 2022. They also have an study uh, with the active trial that theoretically they were finishing in September and the data uh, should be presented in 2024, but I'm not sure there are still, go and this, is, this trial is still going on. Another device for uh, anuloplasty, but this is indirect anuloplasty, is the Carillon. And this device, it, seems, it seemed at the beginning that they will have some, some difficulties with that, but the truth is that probably it's so simple to implant that it make that, uh, it, it turn this device somehow strong in the market, and the thing is that there's another advantage that since you have to put in the coronary sinus, it doesn't interfere with some other uh, type of uh, procedures like a mitroclip or even a transcatheter valve in the future. This is randomized trial led by, uh, led by uh, White and, and, and Sievert, and the truth is that this, this study was a randomized trial with completely blind patients, and they could see that in almost 50% of the patients, and they had a significant reduction of the material regurgitation at 12 months. The results, they're not really impressive, but the truth is, as I say, this is a really simple device to implant. It doesn't interfere with all the techniques, and it might be uh, used in several cases. 
Finally, a few words about the corda. You know that there are uh, two different uh, percutaneous techniques that they are not fully percutaneous because you need a transapical approach for the nano corda and, and harpoon. And really a small series published and two trials going on. And what about the future? So the future probably will go, I'm not saying that the repair will be replaced by the replacement, but probably we'll need to think is that the replacement will allow us to approach a much more patients that we are doing nowadays. So and there are different uh, valves and the market is pretty wide. These three probably there are the three uh, uh, most promising valves, mostly the Tendine, who has the largest series published and really good results. The three of them, for the moment, uh, need to be implanted very transapically. And the three of them, they have some studies in, in, in Tendine and Tiara, they have mostly registries. Tendine will be, uh, will need to be random, it will, has, they have, uh, the FDA has asked to have to do a randomized control trial comparing to MitraClip for getting the approval, the FDA approval in the States. And the Apollo from Medtronic also is uh, planning to do a randomized control trial uh, soon. There are another two valves. The Vogue, uh, it's a valve that was bought by, um, uh, by, by Edwards the, that has been already used in, in Mitral. There is a small series published. So they had some sort of complications and they are using also, the, the, they have probably uh, moved it mostly to the tricuspid till they, they solve all the problems that they got in the Mitral. And the caisson is another study that it can be also implanted transfemorally and transeptally as the, as the Vogue. This is the case of Tendine, a, a beautiful case that was done uh, in Spain. They, they, the two first cases have, have been done, uh, they, they were done also recently. And you can see that there was a really good result. Uh, you can see the valve is perfectly aligned with the annulus. And you can see the corda with the tether that got installed on the apex of the patient. And the truth is that uh, in the studies of the, of the, of, uh, with the th first 100 patients, the results were really good in terms of reduction of mitral regurgitation. Uh, almost uh, all of them, they had uh, less than one uh, mitral, uh, grade of mitral regurgitation. The only thing is that it happens, as it happens in all these patients and all the, on, in all these first studies, the population that was selected was pretty sick population and the mortality at one year follow up, it was close to 26%. That is probably the same that we observed with the TABR in the uh, partners trial in the court uh, uh, B trial. So in conclusion, I would like to, to remember that, uh, that uh, the mitral regurgitation uh, can be uh, safely treated percutaneously, that probably the edge to edge technique is the main maneuver that we are using nowadays to fix these valves that we already have some uh, predictors that uh, help us to select properly the patients. We have some clinical predictors, as I said. We have echocardiographical predictors also. And, and, and moreover, and we have to remember that uh, probably in the future we'll be discussing more uh, this algorithm that you have uh, on the screen that it was done by Taramaso that we'll be discussing where or which is the perfect approach for each patient. So those patients with degenerative MR with no surgical risk, risk probably they'll still uh, need to be operated. Those with high risk, uh, but uh, uh, with a favorable anatomy for transcatheter mitral repair, they will go to edge to edge repair. And instead, if you go to the functional MR, those with a, a, a need a, a, with a, to uh, concomitant revascularization, probably they still go for surgery. And the others will need to select, depending on the mechanism, if we have to send them for percutaneous edge to edge to a, a percutaneous anuloplasty or for transcatheter mitral valve replacement. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Arzamendi. We have some questions for you from the doctor from the Emirates. The first one is, what's the life expectancy after the mitral repair? And so it's, as I said, it's probably, and, and we thought that it might be difference uh, uh, or there will be differences between the two groups that we described, between the patients with degenerative MR and those with functional MR. 
the patients with functional MR, they are patients that have uh, another disease that normally is a left ventricular dysfunction. And we, we expected that the mortality on those group will be higher. But the truth is that when we compare the Spanish in the Spanish registry, the two type of groups, the mortality rate was quite similar. So in, in, during the follow-up in, in our series, the mortality at one year was uh, close to 8%. So it's not large, taking into account this subtype of patients that we are discussing. Perfect, thank you. Another one is, in your experience, what's the youngest patient you operated to repair mitral valve with Francis catheter? So we recently operated a young lady of 40 years old. Four. 40, 40, 40 years old, 40. yeah. The reason was, and, and I think we have another congenital case of 35. The, the, the guy with 35 years, he was uh, operated already four or five times. That was the reason that they, they decided to send it for, for mitral percutaneous mitral valve repair. And he had a functional MR and was perfectly fixed. And the young lady, she was a patient with a, with a, um, a familiar uh, epidemia. So she had a myocardial infection. And due to that, she got a functional MR due to papillary muscle dysfunction. And that's the reason why we treated percutaneously because and she couldn't be discharged from the hospital because she turned into pulmonary edema all the time. And that's the reason why we fixed it. And, and the thing is that the patient did really well. And for us, it's, a, it's, it's, it's perfect because we are used to treat patients really all with very uh, bad quality of tissue. And these patients for us, they're always, always uh, really good patients. Very good. Third one, please. What possible complication may arise from this procedure? So, and there are many uh, described, and the truth is in that, that if you go probably in the, probably the study that they studied the most, the complications was the Everest. And the truth is that main, the main advantage compared to cardiac surgery is was that the, there was a huge reduction of the, of the complications with the transcatheter valve repair. It's true that most of the reduction was due to a reduction on, on the need of blood transfusion, transfusion but and it's true that there were all sorts of complications like uh, peri uh, intervention, uh, atrial fibrillation, pneumonia, and, and, and all sort, other sorts of complications that they were not observed in the mitral clip uh, uh, subgroup. To us, the most frequent complication is the vascular complication. Uh, is uh, the device that we are inserting is a pretty large device, so uh, we use a 24 French. And sometimes uh, you can get some hematoma on the patients, but normally it's a vein. I don't, they don't bleed so much. And, and probably the second most frequent uh, complication described on the series might be tamponade. But uh, the truth is that uh, it's so perfectly echo-guided nowadays that it's really difficult that you get a tamponade because of the transeptal uh, function. So the, and if, when I, we have to explain this procedure to our patients, what we say or we tell we told them is that and the worst thing that can happen is that uh, you will get out from the lab exactly the same as you entered so that we are not able to fix the mitral regurgitation perfectly but there won't be any other sort of complication that's the normal story if you check in the literature you have all sorts of complications it's true, but the rate is really low and during the follow up one uh, complication that needs to be checked is the partial detachment of the leaflets you get tissue at the beginning, the immediate result is most of the times good. And, and in most of the series, the, the initial good result is uh, over 95%. But during the follow-up, it's true that we can see some patients that have a partial detachment of the leaflet. And in some cases, uh, they need to be reintervened for that. OK, thank you very much, Dr. Rosamendi, for Thanks such an you. interesting presentation. Thanks, Thanks to you. so much. Please, doctors, know that if you have more questions, you can put in contact with Dr. Zamendi and team in the email. It's darzamendi, it's D-A-R-Z-A-M-E-N-D-I, darzamendi at sanpau, S-A-N-T-P-A-U, dot cat, dot cat. And the next Kiron Salud Masterclass is going to be presented next uh, Thursday, the 17th, by Dr. Pablo Clavel, Director of the Neurosurgery Department in the Kirin Salud Hospital, Barcelona. Thank you very much for your attention. Bye-bye.